Um, after he has multiplied that meal, that little boy's lunch, uh, the bread was what was left over, eh? uh, and, and they filled 12 baskets with it after they picked it up. And afterwards, he teaches them a lesson about himself from that miracle, and he says, for I am the bread of life. Uh, mm-hmm. that, that's what Christ is. He may be the fish of men, but he's the bread of life. And, and, and we, can never, we can never consume him. He's, he's, he's an overabundant bread of life. Uh, yes, after he has fed all our needs, there's still more of him left behind. And that is why you can never, you can never, your problems can never outweigh God. You can never have too many problems than there is of God in your life. Are you with me? All right. And so that, 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 that's what basically in a nutshell we spoke about yesterday. I wanted to touch on something that we may have left out yesterday and then maybe move on today. Uh, we're going to talk about the subject of prayer. And that's something that we said we need to read the word of God to grow spiritually. You need to read the word of God and also to pray. So um, prayer is talking to God. Reading the word of God is God talking to you. And that's how your relationship grow. now, I want, grows. Rather. And, and now I want to just in a bit of a roundabout way, there are some certain Christian topics that I want to address, but using the main theme of prayer. Are you with me? Okay. So because when you talk about prayer, faith is involved there. When you talk about prayer, there's also the power of God. You talk about prayer, salvation is involved. And so there are a lot of things that fall under this big umbrella of prayer. So I don't think, oh, oh, those kalba must, must turn us. Eh? Oh, oh. That was, we get, uh, pray in the morning, pray in the evening, pray uh, at 3 o'clock and 4 a.m. Now, I'm not about to tell you that, but I'm just going gonna, gonna to tell you what you're missing out on when you don't pray. Amen. All right. And so we, we and by the way, I'm not, I'm not going to tell you that, no, God is powerful to change everything in your life. That's not, a, that's not, that's not like, that's not a biblical message. That is something that, that just is. For, for example, we can never call him God if when we pray to him, nothing happens. Like, I, I, am I making sense? Like the mere fact that he is God means that he can make a difference in our lives. And so I can't sit here and preach as I would stand here rather than preach and say, God is powerful, he can make a difference in your life. Whatever you're going through, God can change it. Because that that that's 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 a given. If I, the moment I say God can, it means that he really can. Like the moment I say God, it means it can. There, there can be changes in your life. And sometimes the greatest changes change when nothing changes in your life. The greatest changes happen and occur when there's nothing that changes in your life. That's when some of the greatest and biggest changes occur, when there are no changes. And, we, we, and, and of course we're talking during the week that we prefer a God who is not only in control of our situations and our circumstances, but a God who is also in control of himself. A God who can, who can maintain control. And when he feels like intervening, uh, he, he just maintains control. He's not, not going to panic about this. He's not going to panic. And so go to a, he goes to a wedding. He goes and collects disciples. He goes and gets baptized. Uh, he goes and, and, and does it, some things before he comes and meets the man who was at the pool for 38 years, whom he knew about for a long time. And so when God delays, he is not denying you redemption. He is simply displaying his ability and the control he has over your situation. Mm-hmm. It may be out of your situation, but never out of his. And that's why he's not going to panic. You panic because you're afraid it's going to get to a point where you can't solve it. He can't panic because it never gets to a point where he can't solve it. Mm-hmm. All right. All right. And, and so if he hurries to your situation, uh, then it means, what is, what, like you must ask yourself, when God answers you so quickly, what, what's the problem? What's the problem with this God? What's he afraid of that he has to arrive so quickly? What was he afraid of? All right. And so sometimes you have to tell him, listen, wait, just wait a bit. Let's see if this thing gets out of control and before before you intervene. Because if he hurries, then, then it means that there's something he's afraid might happen that he can't deal with. Are you with me? All right. So sometimes you've got to let him be God and, and let him delay. Of course, by the way, when we spoke yesterday and we spoke about this man, and, and once again, it, 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 that's the, I, I read a powerful quotation today from, from a writer, Ellen White, um, many of you go her, um, and she says, the, I mean, she says when she talks about God's biddings, she says his biddings are his enablings. His biddings are his, are his enablings. Okay, that's, that's like Elizabeth in English, or post Elizabeth in English, but it's 19th century English. Bidding means whatever he asks you to do, he also enables you to do. Yeah. All right, so his biddings are his enablings. That's like just a summary or a short way of putting it. And I, and I, and I so, so yesterday, uh, when we spoke about the men at the pool of Bethesda, uh, Bethsaida, Beth Tadek, Bait Tadek, House of Mercy, Tadek, Mercy of Grace, uh, Taida, Tadek is grace, Taida is, is mercy, and Bait, House of Mercy. And so when we spoke about that, 
that yesterday, and um, that man was there at the pool of mercy, at the house of mercy, for 38 years, sick, without any mercy, until the man of mercy walked in, until mercy itself, in the person of Christ, Watch walked out. in uh, to Watch deliver out. him. Now, I said that many of us are here in the church, or rather we attend church uh, looking for deliverance and healing, it's a house of mercy, but actually what this is all, what all, all that this is, actually, is just a, a space where all the sick can gather. All right. It's th there's, there's no power about the in the gathering point. All right. There's no power in the gathering point. The power is in the one who has gathered us here. All right. We have come to seek mercy. And so this man came to seek mercy, but he did not know what or who he was looking for. Uh, he knew what he wanted, but he never knew who he was really looking for. When you read the Bible, by the way, when you discover that in the Bible, God, for example, asked Adam and Eve. By the way, this is how we've been preaching the whole week at this tone. So I don't think my sermon has not started. It started. It's <laughs> <laughs> this, like, this is how we've been talking throughout the week. Okay, this is the sermon. It's a lecture. So we, we, this is how we've, uh, we've been talking. Because then afterwards you go home and say, oh, you were powerfully preached because I was loud. And you, had, you, had, you heard nothing because I was too loud. Uh, and I go home with a voice that's, that's, that's damaged, the vocal cords that are, that are, that are damaged. And I can't, my wife can't even hear me when I, when I talk. So this is how I talk. Yeah, this is how we're going to preach. Um, now, we said when you read the Bible, when you read the scriptures, you'll discover that in the, uh, there are times when God asks people questions, when he asks people questions, um, it's never really because he's seeking information. For example, he asked Adam and Eve, uh, he asked Adam in the, in the book of Genesis, Adam, where are you? Now, really, does that mean that God doesn't know where Adam is? Yeah? Does that mean that Adam doesn't, does that mean that God doesn't know where Adam is? I mean, it would be a very careless God if there was a time when God does not know where you are, that he needs to ask, Hey, Dragon, my man, who Shout louder, pray harder, so that I can find you. It, 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 we would have, would be, would be, would be, a God who finds you is not a God. God cannot find you. God must just make himself, must make you aware that He is with you. He can't find you. You have to discover that He has always been with you. God is not found, or you, or God does not find you because He has never lost you. All right, you're the one who becomes aware of his presence. You're, oh, finally. Oh, wow. So there is a God. He's always been there. That's what has kept you alive in ignorance or ignorant of his existence or ignorant of his presence in your life. The very thing that you have been unaware of has been the very thing that has kept you alive long enough to realize that, man, by the way, you hear people say, yo, I didn't have God. I was living without God. No, it's a lie. You, you, there's never been a point where you lived without God. That's why you are like that's a, that's a paradox. You can never say I lived without God. It does, that is why Job's wife says, "Why don't you curse God and die? Why don't you chase Him out of your life so that you can die?" She's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You kick God out of your life, you will die. You can never survive without God. Mm -hmm. All right. And so and so even those that are in a party right now, they are alive. Tomorrow morning they're gonna wake up with a hangover and they're going to and they're going to and they're going to remember what they went through tonight but they're going to be alive tomorrow what is keeping them alive people they're even aware that it's Sabbath today they don't even know what that is they don't care they don't know what that is but they will be alive tomorrow mm -hmm. what has kept them alive you know, some of them are going to walk to their rooms unaware that they're, they're going to be they're going to be out of their minds all right when they walk to their rooms but they're going to get there by the grace of God mm -hmm. the very God they don't even know exists but he exists in their lives. All right. And so God has to ask you, where are you? But he's not asking Adam so that Adam can inform him. He's asking Adam a reflective question. Reflect on this, Adam. Where are you? Are you where I left you? Or are you where I said stay? And so when Christ comes to this man at the pool of Bethesda and he says to him, to him, do you want to be made well? He knows this man wants to be made well. But it's not a question where he wants this man to say no. Yeah, I want to be made well. Then he says, okay, because I can't make you well without your permission, you know. So I have to ask you. So he has to ask, he has to ask like, do you really want the things you want from me? Like what you want? Do you, want, do you really want to be well? Do you want to be well? Um, I, 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 I was pastor at a church where there was a lady who had, was coming to church, but her husband was not coming to church. Mm -hmm. All right. I'm, I'm, make this illustration for you. Her husband never came to church, but she was coming to church. And so this lady got to a point where she 
like her, how do I put this? Her, her claim to fame was the fact that she had a husband who does not come to church. Yeah. All right, there was a claim to there was a, there was a claim to fame. Now you don't know how that works. That's how it worked. She would come to the prayer meetings, and she was known as a prayer warrior, a hard praying woman who had faith in God, even though her husband never came to church. Now all the other women who came to these prayers had faith in God, and they were hard praying. But it wasn't enough. It just didn't have substance because their husbands were in church. So they had nothing to be faithful to God for, all right, without a problem. Now, it, it makes sense to be faithful to God if there is a problem in your life. Ah, shame, I'm going to say, I'm going to say, I'm going to say, I'm going to but she still comes to church. Now, it, 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 it sounds powerful. Unlike, unlike someone who comes to church when they've got a basare, they've got everything they need, and they still come to church. What are you coming to church for? Church makes sense, and church is powerful if it is attended by the sufferers. Mm-hmm. All right. If you're not suffering, then so her claim to fame was that her husband was not coming to church until the husband started coming to church. Whoa. <laughs> then the husband came to church. Then she was like all of us. She was normal. Are you with me? All right. Then she was she was not happy with the idea of her husband coming to church because now all of a sudden people could all that people respected her for was gone. All right. Are you are you are you are you, are you with me? All right. So suddenly, hi. It wasn't, it wasn't the same. She was not longer. She was a prayer warrior, but not that prayer warrior. You know, not that, that prayer warrior. That woman who prayed in spite of her afflictions or her troubles. And then afflictions, rather, and troubles. And so, now, when we, when we, when we, when we, when we ask God of certain things, you got to ask yourself the question, do I really want what I'm asking God for? Like, do I really want it? Not because you're going to lose your claim to fame, but simply because some of the things that you're asking God for come with a great responsibility. Yeah. And some of them are the very things that may return you to a state of living ignorantly of God's presence in your life. Mm. Now, when you say, Lord, I want this, do you really want it? Do you really want it? Honestly, do you want it? Do you want what you're asking God for? You've got to think about it before. He'll give it to you, but sometimes when he gives it to you, it, 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 then it becomes the very blessing that takes you away from the blesser. Mm. Are you with me? Mm. Right. That was a powerful thing we spoke we were talking about the other day. I'm not saying that we are powerful, but the thing we were talking about was powerful. Yeah. 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 The thing we were talking about was, was very was, 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 was powerful. I went home and you know, reflected on it. You know, uh, but like, why do people get rich around you? Everyone gets rich around you, and you remain. <laughs> <laughs> honestly, like everyone, everyone becomes rich. Everyone becomes rich. You, like, like honestly, 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 honestly. I preach to some rich people. Like, I God, it's like. Plant me in the middle of affluent, well-to-do people. I preach to them and they, they leave the church with a better understanding of God and their money. Yeah. <laughs> All I live with is an opportunity to have spoken to people with money. Oh, awesome. <laughs> and a better understanding of God. Are you with me? All right. But still my bank Like, why can't there be an exchange of resources? I give you God, you give me some money. You know, we're all, we all equal. But what? And by the way, you live with a better understanding of God. You go home and you pray, and God just seems to open up heavens to us for you. And I remain with a paintbrush to paint better pictures of God. Now, how does, how does that happen? How does, you know, I mean, have you, have you, have you ever thought about it? And I, and I was reflecting on this, and I went home, and, 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 and this question came up, do you want to be made well? Do you really want it? Do you really, really want it? Do you really, do you, do you really believe your life would be better with this thing? Now, I always say to people, you know what, some of us are denying, are depriving ourselves of the opportunity to experience the love or to experience the power of God to its, to, to like, not to its maximum ex- extent. Like, let me make this illustration. A person who is not working has a better understanding of how God works than a person who works. How? At the end of the month, I have the ability to go buy food and I, I, I fill my cupboards with food. When the food runs out, I don't have anywhere to look to but my pockets. To see if I can replenish my pocket, my, my, my cupboard. A person who's not working Come gets on, to month end with no salary but with food in their cupboard. When the food runs out, they do not look into their pockets because the food never came from their pockets. Watch out, sir. Watch out. Yes. Are you with me? So they can look to, to the source 
of, 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 of to their supplier. They always look to I'm my supplier because I work. But a person who does not work has God as their supplier. And sometimes we say to God, Lord, I, I'm not okay with you being my supplier. I want to supply for myself. Give me a job. Oh. Now, I want to ask the question, do you want to be made well? Oh. Do you really want to? So this, and by the way, and then Christ says to this man, okay, and then Christ says to this man, I don't, I, like, to be really, really careful about this, and then Christ says to this man, get up and walk. Mm-hmm. His buildings are his enablings. When Christ says, get up and walk, the ability to get up and walk is availed to this man. Mm-hmm. He is enabled to walk and get up. But, he's, excuse me, he still needs to tap into that reservoir of abilities that he has not experienced for over 38 years. He still has to get up and walk. Do you understand? He still, like the body has been enabled to get up and walk, but he still has to command his body to get up and walk. I, I, I don't know if I'm making no. sense. He will only discover that he's able to walk, to walk once he tries to walk. Mm-hmm. Are you with me? Yeah. Now, if he decides not to walk, it does not mean that Christ has not enabled him to walk. He is just a person who can walk, who chooses to lie down. Yeah. Are you with me? Yeah. Then God comes to us and says, Remember my Sabbath to keep it holy. In it you shall do nothing but rest on the Sabbath. Now when a person does not rest on Sabbath, it does not mean that the Sabbath has ceased. It just means we have a person who has an opportunity to rest in the presence of God who chooses not to. Watch out. Are you with me? Yes. Right. So we just got a lay person who chooses not to walk. When God says, don't smoke, and you go and smoke, he has given you the ability not to do it. You deciding to do it does not mean you have, been, you have not been enabled to do it. Mm-hmm. Thou shalt not commit adultery. You have been enabled not to do it. But you choosing to do it is not, or is not indicative of the fact that you have not been enabled to do it. You are just lame, choosing, or you have the ability to walk, but choosing to remain lame. Are you with me? Yeah. And we call that obedience. We call that obedience. When you become obedient to God, mm-hmm. you, you decide to do what you have been enabled to do. Obedient. It's not slavery. It's freedom from being lame. Mm-hmm. Are you with me? Mm-hmm. All right. Am I, are, you, are, you, are we okay with that? Mm-hmm. All right. So get up and walk. Just walk. You've been able to do it. Get up and walk. Like, yeah, Christ, take him. He's your savior. Get up and walk. Like, walk with him. Here he is. I know. Hey, Christ, I want to. want to die. Remain lame, but don't blame God for being lame. And by the way, I said to people at least when we were talking about the aeroplane, I said, you know what? If you jump out of the aeroplane while it's mid flight, you, you're landing. I don't know if you're going to land. <laughs> like, or your body will hit the ground. All right, but your landing is not going to be comfortable, to say the least. <laughs> your landing is not going to be comfortable. Are you with me? Now, you can't then say when you jump out of a, 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 an aeroplane and you land and then you crush your bones and you die. Or, or let's, let's say you don't die. And, and then you, 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 you crush your bones and then you break your bones and whatever. And then you, you can't then say, oh, God is punishing me. Why are you punishing me? You're not being punished to jump out of a plane and you broke your bones. It's a logical, you move, you jump out of a moving car, you break your bones. Now, if you are in this plane, there are laws, there are rules that we keep because we are in this plane. If these laws and rules are too difficult for you and you decide to jump out, when you scratch yourself or when you die or when you, or when you break your bones, don't say it is the taxi driver was not driving well. Mm-hmm. You jumped out of a moving taxi. Mm-hmm. You know what? I've never seen people who have decided, you know what, this thing with God is not working out for me, I'm going to stop. And after they have stopped going to church, or after they've stopped their relationship with God, then they become better than they were before. I've never met people like that. I've never met a person who said, I'm leaving the church, I'm leaving God, and come back and said, my life was good, or my life is now good without God. All of them come back, all of them, everybody, everybody, myself included, comes back saying, man, I don't know what I was doing. Why? Because moving out of a moving car, this ship is moving, this aeroplane is moving, it's going to heaven. Jumping out of it, do it at your own risk. 
Are we okay with that? Mm -hmm. Alright, so stay in this, stay in this aeroplane, stay in this ship, stay here, and let's, and let's move together. So tonight, we go to the book of Luke, I'm not going to, I hope, I'm not going to be long. Luke chapter 23, uh, and we, we did touch on this on, on, it was a Wednesday. When was it when you spoke about Luke? Wednesday. Wednesday, you're right, Wednesday. Wednesday. Uh, we look with, I just read from verse 38, and an inscription also was written, Luke 23, 38. Say Amen when you found it. Alright. Don't say Amen when you're still turning the pages when you found it. Alright. 23, 38. And an inscription also was written over him in letters of Greek, Latin, and Hebrew. This is the king of the Jews. Note that. Uh, then one of the criminals who was hanged blasphemed him, saying, If you are the Christ, save yourself and us. Note that as well. But the other answer rebuked him, saying, Do you not even fear God? Now listen to this. Verse 39. One of the criminals uh, blasphemed him, saying, If you are the Christ, name number one. That's the first name. If you are the Christ. That's the first name of Jesus. If you are the Christ, save yourself and save us. And it comes with, it, the, the name comes with, with, what, with what it represents, with an ability. Well, yeah, with what it represents. Well, that's a, not an adjective, but it comes with the, what, what Christ can do. Like, if you are the Christ, you save. He's the Christ, so he saves. All right? And then the other answer rebuked him, saying, Do you not even fear God? Have you no reverence? Because he is God. All right? Now, this is a thief on the cross telling another thief that this Christ, this person you are doubting, this person whose anointing you are doubting is actually God. Yeah. All right. But when he calls him God, he's not saying he's not the Christ anymore. Okay. Hopefully someone got that. Seeing you are under the same condemnation. And we indeed justly, uh, uh, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man, once again, another one. This Christ, this God, this man, all right, um, has done nothing wrong. Another one. Now, if you need, if you need to be saved... Uh, he is the Christ. If you need to be delivered, he is the Christ. If you need uh, someone to be reverent towards, he is God. If you need an example on how to live an innocent life, he is the man, the innocent man. Then he said to Jesus, all right, he turned, the same guy, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, I surely I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. They are not going to be together today in paradise, okay? Uh, he's not saying today we'll be together in paradise, but he says, I'm telling you today, that's, that's even more powerful, I'm telling you right now, today, tonight, that you will be with me in paradise, right now. But it doesn't seem like there's a paradise coming, when death looms, and there are people paying for your blood at the bottom, and, and, and you're hanging on the cross, I'm telling you today that this is not the end. Are you with me? Yeah. Okay, right. And so, uh, yeah, let me, let, me, let me just get straight into it. So, number one, it's the names of Christ on, on, on this thing. That when we when we when we pray, Christ is not God is not the equivalent of your problems. Okay, he's much bigger than whatever it is you're praying to him for. I mean to pray praying to him. Am I right? All right, yeah. Uh, he's, he's bigger than what you're praying to him for. He, he's is he does not stop being what you asked him to do for you. He he is much more than that. All right. So he's he's Christ, he's God, he is the innocent man, he's Jesus, he is the Lord. He is all of these things in one, packaged in one. So in other words, when you, when you, when you need to be saved um, and then suddenly you need a job, you can't then go to someone else to get a job because he is only relevant in as far as you need salvation. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. he, he, also is, he is also still relevant when you need a job. When you, when you want to get into a relationship, and by the way, that's, that, that, that's, one, that's one other thing that maybe we didn't talk about, I'm glad we didn't, uh, that, that we, we, never, we hardly ever do, that we never invite God to like our decisions. We always invite him when, when our decisions show that they were made prematurely without him. Like when, when your decision finally shows you that you made it without God, then you invite God into it. All right, and then you say, Lord, bless what I have chosen, this mistake that I have chosen. Save me from this mistake and so forth. And, and, and I remember when we were growing up, when we were growing up, like other guys did it, I didn't do it. When we were growing up, <laughs> when we were growing up, uh, whenever a girl wanted to break up with a guy, you know, like, by the way, there's a point in life where, like, the guys are after the girls, and you grow, and it changes, everything changes. And you get to a point where it's the girls that are running after the guys. Where at that time, they can grab onto anything. It's not here yet with you guys. Right now, the girls are still being chased. 
But you get to a point where the girls realize, man, my biological clock is ticking. I, want, I can grab on anything that is wrong with All right. Just, just anything. But you know, during that phase, when we were at that phase where we were the ones chasing the girls, the, the, the girls would say, the girls would say, that whenever, like, if you had a girlfriend, they would find girlfriends, and then they would, they, would, they would date these girls and whatever. When the girl wants to break up with the guy, she would say, you know, I want to be serious with my spiritual life. <laughs> oh, yes. oh, with my spiritual life. I, I, like what she really say, what she's really saying is that look, I, I don't want you in my life. That what, what you can say is look, I don't think you were what I was looking for. That's it. You don't have to lie about God. You know, like I, I don't think you are what I, you, you know. I just just want to be serious about my and this relationship is just you know confusing me. It's just taking my head all over the place, I just want to focus on me and God. All right, then you know, she's not really wanting to focus on her and God. All right, and some of them, like two weeks later, they'll pop up with another guy, and you're thinking, man, so, oh, so that's God. <laughs> that's what it looks like, all right. Now, 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 let, 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 me, let, let, me, let me make this, let me make this application, because I know that, that sounds, that sounds, and then that, that was indicative. By the way, when she when, when then when they say, No, I want to be serious, what they're actually saying, what they are confessing, now that statement reveals more about them than the guy. It might say that the guy's a distraction, which might be true, alright? But what it actually says is when you decided to be with that guy, you did not consult God. Alright. So the decision to even to even hook up with that guy was not was made without God. So it, it's actually saying more about you than it does about God. Now like, I wanna I wanna focus on God. Now like did, were you not focused on him all along? Was there not an answer to your prayers? That's what she's saying, but I never prayed for you. <laughs> <laughs> and then so when 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 these problems when these okay so so people they like to use God, they like to attach God to everything, even their ulterior motives and ulterior agendas. They like to attach God to things. It's the same with our prayers. We 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 like to attach God to our problems. We don't like Him to be attached to us. We want Him to be attached to our problems and leave us alone. Deal with the problem and leave me alone. And that's what the thief is, is is reflecting here when he says, you know, if you are the Christ, save save yourself and then save us. Now, number one. If you are the Christ, you're not supposed to be in trouble. God is never supposed to be in trouble. No. All right. If, so if you are the Christ, you should show us that you are the Christ by delivering yourself. All right. First, and then when you deliver yourself, then we can we can know that you can deliver us as well. Now, this guy is a thief. That's why he's on the cross. He was not accused. Uh, 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 he was not accused. He was not accused of of, 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 of thievery, and there was no proof of that. He is not innocent. He is a thief. The reason why he's on the cross is because he stole some things. He could have been one thing. Some serious things. That's why he was crucified. All right. So he must have stolen some serious things, some serious stuff. That's why he's on the cross. But listen to this. When he prays, he does not pray for his thieving disease. He prays for the consequences of his actions. He doesn't have a problem with stealing. He's got a problem with the results of stealing. Now, I don't have a problem with what got me to the cross. I've got a problem with the cross. Now, if you're the Christ, don't save me from me. Save me from the cross. Now, that prayer will not be answered. Tell me or ask me why. You know why that prayer will not be answered? Because it is misdirecting God. God's interest is not in the cross. He's not on the cross. His interest is on the one who's hanging on the cross. He's not there to deliver people from the cross or from crosses. He's there to deliver people from themselves. Because once they're delivered from themselves, they will never work themselves to the cross. Yes. Now, if this guy is pulled down from the cross, the chances are, because he has not been delivered from himself, he will work his way back to the cross. And when we get to the cross again, he will say, Lord, if you are the Christ, <laughs> deliver me. Yeah. Okay. Why? Because God would have delivered. Now, I always make this illustration. I don't know if it, if it applies to any of you guys, but I always make this illustration with, with, with adults. Like, oh, mama, wait. When they get into debt, né? like serious debt, like equally, they serious. Then they say, it happened all the time with my mother. And then they'll say, I can tell you this because she's no longer around. If she was, you, you, you have been. Now, she's dead. That's why I can tell you this. Like, I'm, not, I'm not afraid of telling you this because she's dead. 
I was afraid. I would be afraid of telling you this if she was alive. So I'm not more afraid of her now because she's dead than when she was alive. Are you like yo? <laughs> like she's dead. That's it. Like she can't even hear what I'm saying. Are you with me? She will be told by what I on that resurrection morning if she will if she will if she will uh, arise. That's, I don't I, seriously I don't know if she will be there. The preacher who preached at her funeral said, when Christ comes, your mother will be resurrected. I I don't know if she will be resurrected. That's why when Christ comes, I'm not looking forward to seeing my mother, I'm looking forward to seeing him. Because I'm not sure about my mother's resurrection. I'm, I'm sure about his appearance. Mm-hmm. So, I'm, so I'm, not looking forward, I'm not looking forward to meeting Christ because he comes with my mother. I'm looking forward to meeting him. I want to meet him. I want to see him. And I want to ask him, hey, how could you let my mother die when I was 19? How, how could you let it happen? How, why did you let it? And I, I'm looking forward to the explanation. And you know what? Perhaps his appearing will just be will be enough to answer my question before I even ask him. I'll just see him and I'll think, oh, that's why she had to die. Mm-hmm. All right. So I, I I don't want God. I don't want to meet God because of what he comes, what he brings with himself, or whatever. I just want to see him. I want to see him. Because it's not guaranteed that. Okay, I don't know how I got there, but anyway, <laughs> my mother would get into debt. Then she'll get into debt. She'll make all these equally to this, and then she'll get into serious debt, and then she'll and then and then. Of course, because debts want money, and then people will start calling, then she starts ignoring the phone. Like, <laughs> it'll ring at home, and you'll go and answer, <laughs> Like, all of a sudden, things, things just become sour and lousy. Like, you can't even ask, you can't even ask for, for, for you, can't, you can't ask for things that you should be getting. Like, ma, you think what's Hey! Why do you say for me? Like, all of a sudden, like, it becomes, it becomes a problem. Now, she'd get into this day, she'd get into, she'd get into debt, like any other household, the reason why you are laughing is because you have seen it in your own house. <laughs> she gets into these problems and then she and then and then we'll pray and say, Lord, get us out, get us out of the debt or give us more money and whatever. Now, I, I, I'm not here to tell you about my mother, but she has an amazing she had an amazing story. Like she started off as a as you know in the pharmacy in the chemist, I don't know if they still do it at pharmacies. She was working at a pharmacy in the Lucia Mall. And what, what she was doing was she was that lady who would come when you're on the island, she'd say to you, Can I help you with anything? Like she was not a pharmacist. That's a story I told my friends in primary school. But she was, just, <laughs> she was a lady who used to ask people, can I help you with anything? And then, they'll, she, and then she'll say, oh, you're looking for this. And then she'll go to the pharmacist and say, she is looking for this. And then the pharmacist, no, it's where, or whatever. And like, but she had to know where them. She knew where the meds are. She, didn't know what, she did not know what they did. All right. So that's where she started. And then she worked for a doctor as a receptionist for a doctor. As a receptionist, all right. Not, I called her the doctor's assistant, all right. And then, and, but when my mom died, she died in an internal auditor at the municipality. Mm-hmm. Like when, when, when she, I, I'm proud of that, like of her Power. Power. Now, you wonder what has that to do with everything? When she was a pharmacist, a pharmacist. <laughs> <laughs> when she was a, when she was a pharmacist, all right. The money she was making as a pharmacist was much less than that which she was making as a reception a doctor's assistant. All right. So she worked as a pharmacist. Then she worked as a doctor's assistant. Then she went and cleaned. Who named that place at It's a hostel in town. All right, a hostel, a ladies' hostel. She was cleaning there at Togoza. That's what she did. She was a cleaning lady. That's how she got into the municipality. Right, as a cleaning lady. Now, so she got more money. Uh, well, she got money here, but let's say 500 rand as a, as a pharmacist, and then she got 1,600 rand as a doctor's assistant, and then she got 3,000 rand as a cleaning lady working for the municipality, and then she got some serious money when she was working as an auditor. But there was something common in all these stages. Watch out. Watch out. The dates. <laughs> now, when we used to pray, we used to say, Lord, please give Mama more money so that she can finish the debt. But she got more money. The more money she got, the more debt we made. The more money we got, the more debt we made. All right. When she died, I compared the debts that we had had with, at the time of her death and at the time when she was an, as, as a pharmacist. All right. It looked like she was smarter as a pharmacist with less money than she was as an auditor with more money. Now, what was the problem? We got more money. The problem was not the debt was not indicative of the fact that we don't have enough money. The debt was indicative of the fact that we could not manage money. The problem is not with the money. 
The problem is with the person who has been given money. Are you, am, I, am I making sense? I'm not doing any debt counseling, right? I'm just making an illustration. Now, when, when, that is why every time you fall into debt, you will pray, you will pray for God to deliver you. And God delivers you, and then you will fall into debt, and you will, the same amount of panic that faced you, that, 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 yeah, that you faced with, that you were faced with, or that encompassed you in your first problem, Regardless of how many problems you can get, how many times you can get into the same problem, the same amount of panic, the same amount of mistrust, the same amount of fear will always envelop you. Why? Because though you keep getting in and out of this problem, you are never changing. Yeah. Now the prayer that we pray, a prayer that is answered, is not a prayer that asks God to change the problem. It is a prayer that asks God to change you in the problem. <laughs> Am I making sense? Yes, sir. Now that's why the second thing prayer says, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Not my problem, not this cross. I don't, and I, I don't know how, you know, this thief, but some, someone says it's through the Holy Spirit that this thief could understand, look at Christ and understand that, man, if I can attach myself to this guy, I will live beyond this cross. Mm-hmm. My death will not be the end of me. Not that I will be alive when I die. Like, I will die, that's why I die. So not, that's why they kill you. That's why they're killing him. They're not killing him so that he can be a better person when he's alive. They're killing him because they, they want him to stop living. He's not going to suddenly be alive when he's dead. So they kill him and, and, and he realizes, man, you know what? There's hope for me if I attach myself to this guy. That this cross will not be the end of me. Now listen to this. He never went to church. He never sang any hymns. I doubt he knew any songs, any Christian songs. He never went to church. He never sang any hymns. He never returned any time, but he will be in heaven. Power. <laughs> Why? Because he did not attach himself to the things of the world. He attached himself to Christ. He did not. He did not attach himself to the pool like the man in, in John chapter five. His hope was not in the pool. It was not in the things that were around him. His hope was in Christ. He knew that his hope, his deliverance was in Christ. And I like how this guy prays. He does not direct Christ to his problems. He directs Christ to him. And you wonder why David says, you prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. God is not running after my enemies. He is preparing a table for me. That's the priority, not my enemies. You are the priority. Not, not, and by the way, I, I, said, I said this during the week. That a Christianity to a prayer life that is, that is, that, 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 that is problem oriented. I always said that surrounds problem. A, a, a Christian life, a prayer life that is problem oriented is a prayer life that is sustained by the devil. Like, like we said during the week, that man, in order for you to pray to God, you need the devil to torture you. So, tortures you. They're like, oh, God, yeah, shut up. Because the devil is burning you. Then suddenly you know where God is. Then you know where God is. But the moment the devil starts burning you, then you don't know who God is. Like we, we, you don't, you suddenly don't know where, who God is, and and and, and like I, I, I usually tell the story of a, of a, of a guy who, who graduated uh, from university. I'm not gonna say which campus, but he graduated from university, and he and he got a job, and he, well, rather he graduated, he couldn't get a job, so we prayed with him, and he could, he would come to church every every day, like every, not every day, every Sabbath, he would be early to church, we would pray with him, we had times where we prayed four o'clock in the morning, like we, you know. You, you choose the most obscure times that the devil is after you when problems are, are when problems envelop you. You choose like the most awkward of times. You must it must be painful. <laughs> yeah. I wake up at three and I pray, Lord. Hear my cry. When everyone else is you get angry, people who are sleeping. You, drink what they drink. you get angry. Everyone is sleeping, Lord, but I'm away praying to you. Won't you answer my prayer? Lord, I have fasted. I'm not eating, I'm not drinking any water. And suddenly, somehow, your prayers become fuel for God to act faster, and, and, and the problems become fuel for you to pray harder. So because your problems are burning you, you also burn God. <laughs> Hear me, Lord. And you get angry. You get angry. Your family is sleeping. They're, they're supposed to be sleeping. I'm alone in this, Lord. Look at them. They're sinners. Everyone becomes a sinner. Your problem is not that you like praying. Your problem is that you've got problems. Now, the moment the problems disappear, you suddenly, someone asks you, pray for me and pray with me at 4 o'clock. <laughs> why must you wake up so early? Yeah. Tickle 10, I don't know. I think here during the afternoon. <laughs> but when it was your turn, when it was your problems, everyone must wake up. 
Why? Why is that? It is because your prayer life is not genuine. It is not sincere. It is sustained by the devil. And you know what, Shem, the, the devil's problem is he can't help himself. He has to torture us. He can't, like he sees you. <laughs> it's, like, it's, like, it's like little kids. Have you seen little kids and puppies? Have you seen the things kids do to puppies? <laughs> like, or, or small, weak animals? Have you ever seen the things they do? Like when everyone is normal, no one is looking. Kick it. <laughs> look, oh, and then they pick it up. <laughs> it's, it's a child, it's a kid, it's a small child. Eh? It's a small kid, it's a small kid. I remember when I was a child, my grandmother had chicken. I used to hit them with sticks. Like I'd hit them. I don't know what was wrong with me. I'd hit this thing and I'd aim for the head. So you hit the chicken on the head, you hit it, and then it runs and it, and it looks around. I used to. And, but when it does that, I used to get scared that this thing might die. And I'd be in trouble. And then as soon as it regains its consciousness, you laugh because you get wow. But the funniest thing I've just seen. It regains and it starts walking again and you grab the stick and you think of and you think of it. It's me, it's cool. You do it when not you don't know where it comes from. You don't know why you wanna do it. But you must just touch it. That's how the devil is. When he looks at you, he just looks at you this. Why are you smiling? <laughs> he just has to torture you. He has to do something to you. <laughs> he can't help it. Are you with me? He can't help it. He, he is, he is me. That, that guy is me. He's, he's just horrible. He's just a terrible person. He can't help himself but torture you. Now, that is our saving grace. Yeah, man. The devil's meanness. Yeah, man. That's what keeps us close to God. That the devil cannot be, he cannot do anything good. Now, he's not capable of anything good. Pastor Bob usually says, when the devil says to you, hey, this page is white, you must say, aha, it's not. <laughs> he says, okay, what color is it? It's white. What color is it? No, it's white. Says, but I just said it was white. Now I know. But I know the reason why you were saying it was not food. <laughs> if, I, I, I refuse to believe anything. That's how, that's how bad the devil is. Even when he tells the truth, he tells it to lie. Yeah. It tells it to, 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 to deceive you. Now, 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 there's nothing good in him. So he can't not torture you. So that's why you always have problems. It is not because God is careless. It is because the devil does not want to see you happy. Are you with me? All right. Now, don't let the devil's inability to live with happy people be the one thing that sustains your prayer life. Every time you go to God, and I said, said during the week that, you know, like, that I, I, I'm not sure if this is, this is what actually happened. This is just my, my take on events. I think the devil throws a problem in your life. He throws it, and then he goes to his angels and to his brothers, and he says, listen, look, look at her. She's going to pray, or he's going to pray. This is how important I am. That when, when God and his people meet, they don't part without mentioning me. Okay. Now look at this. Listen to this. And then the devil watches you go to pray. And then you pray. And when you pray, you say, Lord, thank you for today. Thank you for the clothes on my back. And every little thing that we are not really grateful for, but we say thank you because so, just so that the prayer can be long. <laughs> and then and then you say, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. And then, Lord, what did I tell you? I'm important. Whenever they meet, they talk about, they never part without talking about me. Now, you thought that was the last one. Listen to their pastor as well. And then he throws a problem in my life. And I go, this, I do the same thing and I go and I pray. I say, Lord, thank you for the opportunity to serve you. Thank you for everything you've done in my life. Oh, but Lord, the devil is worrying me. And then he and, and turns around and says, look, even their pastors, <laughs> they can't talk to their God without mentioning me. I'm important. I'm, stick with me. I'll take your places. <laughs> My name gets heard in heaven all the time. Mm. They kicked me out of heaven. Yes, sir. Because they thought I would not. But look at look at this. Even al although I'm not in heaven, it is their prized possessions that take me back. Mm. That's what mm. happens when we pray for problems. Say, Lord, I've got problems. I've got issues. I've got troubles. And God is saying, No, but I don't want. I don't want to. I don't want to solve the problem. I want to solve you. I want to solve you. I want, I want to solve you. That, 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 that's what I want to deal with. I didn't create the problem. I don't, want to, I don't want to be responsible for something I didn't create. I want to be responsible for something I created and I created you. Let me, let me, let me be predictable and, 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 just, and just share with you like the, 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 the three Hebrew boys, you know, in the fire. 
They're in the fire, they burn. They don't get burnt. Remember? Book of Daniel 4, 3. 3. Yeah, it's in the book of Daniel. They, they, we eat it, tell you a part of it. I'm sure a pastor not knowing where the verse is. Now, <laughs> now these, these, these boys are, 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 are in the fire. They, 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 they get in the fire. Like, I, I know that our prayers, our prayers would have been, Lord, save us from this fire. Lord, make the logs wet. Lord, let it rain. Let's just, let there be a storm and just let it rain. Let the fire may not be lit. And we would panic when we see that everything we've asked God to do is not happening. That's why we would panic. But God, when we ask God to make it rain, and God does not let, does not bring the rain, and God decides he's not going to panic, and he relaxes, and then we say, Lord, okay, at least okay, well, just bring down lightning. Yeah. <laughs> just bring down lightning and strike them all and bend them all. All right. And then and then God doesn't 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 do that. And then they until they bind you. And they grab you and they bind you. Hey, I, okay, let me not get, get it away. Then they bind you and they take you into the fire and then they throw you. Like then when they throw you into the fire, then you start you start thinking, Why have you forsaken me, Father? We're not feeling you God. Why are you so much? And then right there you realize that I'm about to die, then I must I must be okay with God before I die. <laughs> but even so, Lord, let you <laughs> Because you know you can't die at all with God. So even so, Lord, let your will be done. And then they throw you into the fire. Now the greatest miracle is not in you. It's not you not being thrown into the fire. The greatest miracle is you being able to breathe in the fire. You alive. The ropes they tied you with. All the fire does is it burns the ropes they tied you with. Watch this. And you can stand in the fire. Watch out now. That's the greatest miracle. It is not that God stopped you from getting into the fire. The greatest miracle is the fact that you are alive in the fire. The greatest miracle is not in God delivering this thief from the cross. The biggest miracle is the thief being able to see God when he's enveloped by trouble and pain. That for this guy, in, in the midst of such pain, in the midst of such trouble, in the midst of such noise, right above the noise, right there on the cross, the, the brightest thing that shone for him, the greatest thing for him, was not his pain, it was the presence of God. Mm. Yeah. That was the miracle. That's the greatest miracle that happened. And 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 and, 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 and that's where we see that, you know what? Then suddenly we realize, no, no, God, God doesn't have an interest with our problem, and he so he should not be interested in our problem because the problems never stop him from being God in our lives. They never prevent him from from being God in our lives. They never stop him from being from being our savior, from being from being the Lord. And by the way, these boys, these boys when they're thrown into the into the into the fire, they're thrown because they refuse to bow down to a statue. And when they get says, I'll throw you into the fire and I'm gonna see. I wanna see which God will be able to deliver you from my hand. And in chapter one, verse one says, and God delivered and God gave the Israelites into the hands of Nebuchadnezzar. And then in chapter three, he has forgotten chapter one that God had given the Israelites into his hands. And when he sees he's got them in their hands, and then he says, I want to see who will deliver you from my hands. Then the boy says, the boy say, our God is able to deliver us. Even if he doesn't, we will not bow down to your statue. Now, that's very powerful. You want us to stop worshipping God. The alternative, yet the alternative you are providing is not even close to what God is. Now, just like Moses, we would rather die in the desert with God than to live in a promised land without him. Alright. So we would rather die worshipping God, worshipping a God who is able, than to live while worshipping a statue. The alternative to God is just not powerful enough. Watch out, sir. Death is okay. Death is death is alright. Like I'd rather die than worship a statue. The alternative is just, it's just not, in fact, worshiping the statue is just death on its own. But it's better to die for God than to die because I will. Do you understand? It's better to die because I'm not worshiping a statue than to die because a statue has failed to play God in my life. And we say, no, 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 stop this alternative lifestyle. Stop drinking, stop this partying thing, stop this thing that in this life without God. Okay, stop it. Just stop it. Like, it. We're not saying stop it because God 
is not happy with it. Yes, he is unhappy with it. But it's just the wrong alternative to God. Man, pick something more powerful than a party to God. No. If you must have something that will occupy your life in God's place, let it be more powerful than God. Okay, at least let it be a God that is powerful as God. You, 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 you absolutely cannot tell me that you are living a life without God. You are replacing God with something that will not be able to deliver you when you need it. Lord, listen, Nebis, listen, our, our God is powerful, He is able, but even if He doesn't, your alternative sucks. Mm. Yeah. Yes, sir. So we'd rather, we'd, rather, we'd rather go with this guy who might choose not to. By the way, it's a risk. <laughs> he might choose not to, but men would rather go with him, as unpredictable as he is. In fact, we like his unpredictability. Mm. And, then when they, and, then, and then when they end the fire, Nebuchadnezzar gets his, the answer to his question, who will deliver you from my head? And he says, did you not, did you not put in three guys in there? Did you not, where's the fourth one coming from? And we thought, I was talking, I was talking, I was talking air when I, when I said to you, God does not get into your problems. You find him in your problems. That is why when the boys are called out of the fire, the fourth man does not come out of the fire because nobody sent him into the fire. Nobody has the right to call him out because nobody sent him in. He did not join the boys in the fire. They found him in the fire. The fire was already prepared to provide a worship environment. Right there, walking about in the fire, walking about an act of defiance. How do you walk about in the fire? The very thing that is supposed to inhibit your every ability to walk. Now go to Acts chapter 16, verse 25. It says that midnight, Paul and Silas were in a Roman prison. They were praying and singing. They were singing and praying. All right, that's what they were doing. And in the middle of midnight, their bodies they'd been beaten up, they'd been lashed. All right, and there they were in the prison. And I, and, I, and I want to suggest to you, they were not praying for God. You know, I've never to, like, say tagat. I don't know how to say it in English. But I'm not tagat, tagat and tagat. What? You know tagat and which crap? Yeah, which crap? Tagat, yeah. It's not nice to say tagat. Which crap? Like, which crap? When, when, when. Yeah, some of us are, are, are glorified witches and wizards. Like, tagat and tagat. When people, when people, when people wrong you, you then go and say, Lord, even my enemies remember them. Oh, tara, tara, tara. Like, <laughs> suddenly God is like, God, my enemies are about me. Please, Lord, don't let them consume me. Lord, visit them. Now, <laughs> now when you say God must visit our enemies, we are not saying he must go there with good intention. No. We are almost like Jonah. We are almost like Jonah. When, when, when God then decides to save our enemies, then we rebel. And you see your enemy progressing. And you are saying, but Lord, my enemies are doing well. I know it is their father, the devil. When it is the God you sent to visit them. Hey. Yes, sir. And now, some of us are, are like that. Say, Lord, so these boys, they were in the prison. When they're there with their bodies aching, they are praying to God. They are praising God. They are praising. They are not praying. They are praising. Mm. Singing and praying at the same time. In the prison. They were taken to the prison so they could stop spreading the gospel of God, but in the prison they are praising God. Why? Because their worship is not determined by their location. It is determined by the presence of God. Right there in the middle of that prison, God was with them. That is why they could pray to him. Now, the Bible says then the gates were open. They do not rush out. Why? Because when the gates are open, it is not an answer to their prayers. It is, it is, it is, it is, it is expected that the gates will be open when God is in the prison. Yes, sir. Am I talking to someone there? Mm. It, is, it, is, it does not surprise them. When the gates are open, they don't go, Oh, hey, una man, They don't, because they knew, of the, they knew God's ability. So God, when God displays himself, they, oh, that's how he chooses to show his power today. They don't, they don't run out of the prison because that's not what they were praying for. They remain in the prison because that's where God was. Mm. So for them, God opening the prison was not a way for them to get out. It was a way of them to understand that God is here. The opening of the prison is not an opportunity to escape with your life because they still had their lives in the prison. They didn't run out. They stayed there. Why? Because that's where God was. Who's so are praying for God to deliver you from your problems? I'm praying for God to deliver you from yourself. Some of the problems we're in, 
are not because God is careless. It is because we have chosen to start them without God. Mm -hmm. Now ask you this question. How many of you here, before you started, prayed and said, Lord, show me what I need to start? God bless you. <coughs> not many of us, eh? <laughs> we like really just spend months and weeks. Like, you know the same amount of time you spend praying over a problem? Like, how many of us spend that much time asking God for guidance on a decision we have not yet taken? But when you suddenly run out of fees, who do you remember first? The very person you got into it without. It's the same problem the disciples had. Christ says to them, let's get into the boat, let's go over to the other side. It is Christ who says, let's go over to the other side. Where the encounter is stopped in the middle of the ocean, in the middle of a journey that was started by Christ. Then they want to solve the storm. They don't want to take the problem to the one. Hey, my man, I think, when was they tell her, now there's a storm. Mm -hmm. Why did you bring us here if we were going to encounter a storm? Now you deal with the storm. If instead, they try and steady the boat, they try and steady the boat, and then when they could see that their powers were failing them, then they ran down to Christ who's sleeping in the boat, who knew about the storm before it even came. That's why he slept. Then they say, carest thou not that we perish? And then... Someone says, wow, what a prayer warrior. <laughs> because you're approaching God with a problem he had nothing to do with. A problem about a journey or that you've encountered on a journey that you did not consult him with about before you even got into it. And when you start consulting him in the middle of the journey, then someone says, yo, you are powerful, you pray. Now, I'm not here to close the door for you and say, yo, you are in it, you are alone. I like, I, like, I, like how God, I like how God works. That even when we have taken these journeys on our own, it's allowed that, okay, go on, make your plan. All right, go with it. He sustains us through them until we come out of the problem. Now, God is not sustaining you so that you can say, man, yeah, really, I was sent here by God. He sustains you through it so that you can learn never to take another journey, never to take another decision without God. Are you with me? All right. So, let's start praying to God to change things. Let's start praying to him for Him to change us. Let's just pray for Him to change us. Let's have that ability to communicate with God without the devil's help. Let's just talk to Him without the devil assisting us. Let's have that ability to talk to Him. Just communion with Him and talk to Him. Just ask Him for advice. You know? Sometimes, just learn not to trust yourself and just... Say, Lord, I can see this thing. I can see that this thing is blue, but I'm not sure if I'm seeing it right. I, can I just confirm with you, is it really blue? Just be, just, just, just learn to trust him to that extent. Say, Lord, man, I, 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 don't, I, I, I don't know what's happening in my life, but I just want you to deal with me first. Just change me, transform me first. Help me. May I just tell the story? of a lady who, mom keys, because <laughs> I saw him first, right. and she was sitting in the kitchen, she was sitting in the, she was standing in the kitchen like she clean, and she'd look out into the, into the neighbor's house, and she would look out her window, and she would see the neighbor's curtains, and, and they were dirty. So she'd complain to the husband and say, yo, I'm a kitty, come on, child, I have to leave. Now it's so dirty, look at it, she never washes them, she never cleans. I wonder if the curtains are that dirty, I wonder what the rest of the house is like. <laughs> and then the husband would go, mm, -hmm. and then, like most husbands, <laughs> go out, mm, -hmm. and walk away. And then come back the next day, and she'd be standing over the sink, and she'd be looking at the neighbor's curtains. And look at the curtains, so dirty. Yo, I wonder if she even baths, if she can't clean, the one thing that everyone can see. And the husband would go, mm, hey, yeah, and he'd walk out. <laughs> the following day, she, same thing, same thing, until... On the Friday, this lady looks out her window and she goes, Ooh, oh, I wonder what happened. She washed her curtains. Maybe someone must have finally walked up to her and told her that her curtains are dirty. The husband says, no, I just cleaned our window. Now, the problem the biggest problem might not necessarily be what you consider a problem. 
the biggest problem in your life might be the fact that you are unable to see the real problem. And the real problem is you can't see God with you. That's the biggest problem. It is not, it is not, it is not that God, it is not that God is, is, is not with us, it is not that God doesn't care. It is not, the, the biggest problem is with us. The problem is with us, our ability to see. It is not the problem on the other side. There's no problem on the other side. You are the problem. And that's what God wants to solve. That's what God wants to deal with. He wants to clean that window, that lens through which we view the world. So that suddenly we may see that man, things are not as bad as we thought they were. Being able to see our lives through God's eyes. And maybe that's the prayer that we should pray tonight. That God help us to see our lives as you see them. Mm-hmm. Help us to see where we are as you see us. So anyone wants to pray with me along the same line. My eyes are closed, my hands are bowed. We pray, dear Father, here we are tonight once again on your Sabbath day. We thank you that you have visited us yet again, dear Lord. We thank you, dear Father, that your presence with us will not end when we leave this hall, this auditorium, but you will continue to walk with us wherever we go, dear Father. We thank you, dear Lord, for all the wonderful things that you do for us, those that we notice, that we consider significant, and those that we take for granted. And this evening, oh dear Father, we just come with one prayer, dear Lord. We're not sending you to our problems, but we're sending you to us.